Hello and greetings from the Crown Plaza Hotel in um, Springfield, Illinois. I'm headed back to Appleton right now. I should be there later this afternoon, hoping to post this video before for you this morning before we take off again. You will notice the delightful music in the background for this presentation, so I hope you enjoy that. So today we're going to be looking at um, moral cognition and cognitive science, and also I want us to think about neuroscience and how it relates to cognitive science in this lecture. So first of all, I wanna talk about the relationship between brains and minds. So we've touched on this before when we've talked about dualism and views that oppose dualism. Um, we've talked about how uh, those other views, um, uh, the views that oppose dualism all suggest that there's an important connection between brains and minds. But what is this connection? Well, um, <clears throat> before the eight, 19th century and the 18th century and before, you might've been excused for thinking that um, minds were totally uh, located in an immaterial substance that had only incidental connection to the body because before that point, it hadn't really been discovered about how deep the connections were between different brain areas and different mental capacities. Now, we know nowadays that the mind is clearly intimate, intimately related to the brain, but how did all this knowledge start? Well, specifically the first kinds of examples of this were due to uh, lesion studies and um, we talked about this a little bit last time. We talked about uh, subitizing, but again, lesions are just injuries to specific parts of the body. But typically when lesion studies are discussed in cognitive science, the part of the body we're talking about lesions occurring on is the brain. And so these lesions will be caused by uh, strokes, sometimes high fevers, sometimes uh, brute injuries in some way. But by uh, looking at the way in which these injuries have impacted the brain and the way in which um, uh, that has in impacted behavior, we can actually discover the way in which brains and minds are related to one another. <clears throat> so lesion studies of the brain, again, are caused by these kind of naturally occurring damages, such as tumors, blood clots, blood trauma, defects, or strokes. And um, also uh, in animals, we may uh, do lesion studies by artificially cutting, burning, or um, in recent studies using gene knockout to cause parts of the brain not to develop. But in all these cases, the artificial approaches are um, going to be um, used on animals. And indeed, uh, there is a big, uh, I mean, this kind of practice of using le lesion studies to investigate the brains of animals and the minds of animals began uh, in the 1700s when it was revealed that the breathing of dogs depended on the medulla. And if you were able to uh, lesion the medulla, a dog would cease to breathe and would die from that, okay? So those are very invasive lesion studies. Medulla is a large part uh, at the bottom base of the brain. Um, and so these were very primitive, uh, uh, brute studies, but um, over the next few years, um, uh, you know, the next few centuries, these methods have increased quite a bit. <clears throat> Uh, following up on those dog studies in the 1700s, um, in the 1800s, there were a few uh, specific examples of lesions in humans that were very influential. So one of these um, was uh, involved the French psychologist Broca, who um, first uh, linked cognitive function to specific areas of the brain in humans. And this occurred in the 1860s. So um, Paul Broca was uh, brought in to examine he was a medical doctor. I, I called him a psychologist, but it's not really fair. He's a medical doctor at the time. Um, this is in some sense before the dawn of psychology. And Broca was brought in to uh, examine a patient. This patient had, uh, ability, had an inability to use language. Um, he had a kind of degenerative language uh, disorder. And the patient was actually known as Tan at the time because this is the only uh, syllable that he could pronounce was the word Tan. Um, or is the only word he could pronounce. I don't actually know what the word tan stands for in French. Maybe I should have looked that up. But in any case, as a French patient, um, Broca is brought in to examine him. He works with the patient for a while. A short time after he's introduced to him, though, the patient dies, and Broca was able to examine the brain of this patient, uh, to perform an autopsy on this patient after he died, and find um, a large uh, uh, area in his brain that had been a lesion due to this degenerative disease over time. So this is the area here, this is the actual brain. And so um, we see here, uh, this destruction of this area is destruction to um, what's called Broca's area. So Broca's area is this area named after him. And what's found, what was found was 
that um, our semantic knowledge of language, our knowledge of the words of language is localized in this area of the brain. And with deficits to this area of the brain, um, you could have a real uh, loss to language capacity. So <clears throat> another study um, that uh, was influential here, oh, I think I've actually removed it, um, but you may have seen the study of, um, or you may have seen the results of Phineas Gage, a kind of famous um, uh, uh, example of a railroad engineer who uh, one time when he was, he, his job was to essentially pack the explosives that they were going to use to blow through large deposits of rock to lay new track as they were building the railroad in the 1800s in America. So <clears throat> Phineas Gage, as he was doing this, he made a mistake and hit the uh, packing, uh, the um, explosive in the wrong way such that it set off the charge and fired the tamping rod he was using through his, um, through his uh, lower chin and up through his uh, brain, coming out on the left side of his, of his brain. It actually, um, he was blinded in his left eye in the course of this, um, but also uh, there was damage to prefrontal areas of his brain. And people who knew Gage had reported that he was previously mild-mannered, uh, thoughtful, a very moral person. But after this accident, he, he sort of changed. So even his close friend said, after the accident, Gage was not Gage. So um, it uh, blew out some areas of his brain in the prefrontal cortex that are really related to emotional processing and higher functioning and um, you know, higher reasoning, moral reasoning. And after this point, it was found um, that Gage uh, you know, slipped into kind of degenerate lifestyle, um, began uh, cursing, which he never did before, and all of these, and, and was cruel to people. So in all these ways, he changed after this accident. And so this was a real indication that emotions too are impacted by the brain, that our emotional uh, mental life is intimately connected with the brain. <clears throat> now, in our current time, we have implemented these kinds of brute lesion studies that again were caused accidentally when we're looking at humans and not, um, not with a, a, the kind of uh, specific care that you might want to have if you were trying to identify in a fine-grained way what areas of the brain are affecting processing. So in our own time, we have um, found, uh, well, actually back in the 19th century again, um, Richard Catton uh, discovered that there were electric currents in the brain that varied with different presented stimuli. So if you present people with some stimuli, it causes electric currents to change. And over the course of the end of the 19th century, the 20th century, um, this became a real insight. And eventually we have developed tools for looking at brain, the electrical brain functioning of brain. So this is an electroencephalograph, an EEG uh, applied here to a baby. We're, we're attempting to hire a cognitive neuroscientist right now. It could be that she would use this kind of method if she came here, an EEG um, to look at babies. So if you are at Lawrence and you end up going into neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, you may have an opportunity to participate in these kinds of studies. But here, um, these electrodes are recording brain activity for the, from a baby's skull, from a baby's brain inside of their skull. And so um, <clears throat> this can be done on babies or on adults. It's getting really cheap to produce the kinds of caps to use to record this stuff now. But um, what they do here is essentially, as you see, there are electrodes that are arranged in sort of a, a triangular pattern relative to one another. So they pick up signals, electrical signals coming from the brain and they're able to triangulate to um, sort of uh, uh, abstract away from those three impulses to localize that electrical impulse inside of the brain itself. So to know what area of the brain is active when a child is performing certain processing or when an adult is, is performing certain processing. So in our own time, electrical recordings have um, greatly implemented the, uh, the uh, tools that were previously available in the 19th century, such as lesion studies, which were, uh, again, very brute. Um, and then additionally, we don't do this on humans, but on uh, animals, we can perform single cell recordings. That should be recordings, not recordings. So essentially what a single cell recording is, is um, <clears throat> what, what people will do is they will implant an electrode into, for example, here, a rat's brain. Um, and this electrode will be pinpointed to a particular electro, I mean, to a particular neuron. And um, whenever that neuron fires, it'll pick up in a very fine grained way where that activity was localized in the brain. So then you can run the rat through various tasks and examine what areas of the brain are active. 
Now, this method has to be used by killing the rats afterwards and identifying precisely where the electrode was implanted and what information it was picking up. This obviously is not a method we would want to use on human babies. So even though it's more precise in some way, it is not something that's applicable for human beings. But still, it has provided a useful tool for investigating animal models for neurological um, capacities. And then a third kind of tool that's become available to us in the 20th century is uh, various different kinds of brain scans, right? So EEGs can identify activity in large brain regions, but they lack good spatial resolution. EEGs are really good at temporal resolution. They're really good at picking up on activity within the brain uh, at a very fine-grained level over time. Oh, this music's really going now. Um, <clears throat> but uh, but um, we need something better for looking at, um, diff at more fine point areas. And so uh, one of these tools is positron emission tomography scan, a PET scan. Um, and then um, for this kind of tool, radioactive material is injected in the bloodstream. Um, we also know, for example, that blood travels to areas of the brain that's active. It's not only electromagnetic activity that is put off by these brain regions, but also um, a bl a blood uh, flows to areas that are involved in processing. So um, we can inject radioactive material into the bloodstream and examine where the blood travels in the brain, right? <clears throat> because uh, again, there will be increased blood flow to the areas that are active. So this PET scan will then detect increases in activity by decreasing increases in blood flow by detecting increases in radioactive material in particular spaces in the brain. Um, right, so what they'll do is they'll uh, have people in a PET scanner, they will ask them to do particular mental tasks, and then the PET scan will detect which regions are the most active. Um, and then finally, uh, so, so I mean the, the kind of PET scan method, positron, positron emission uh, tomography, is, is very useful, but of course it also requires injecting people with radioactive material, um, which is not great. So um, this fourth kind of way of looking at brains is um, uh, uh, the, the sort of becoming the kind of um, thoroughbred method of looking at brains. And so this is uh, the magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. And so um, essentially what uh, MRI does is it, it uses a large magnet to detect signals from the hydrogen nuclei of water molecules in the body. So of course the body is comprised uh, uh, in large part by water, um, and uh, the blood is, is obviously uh, composed uh, more of water than the rest of the body. So again, we're doing essentially the same thing of detecting blood flow with this technology, but we're not using uh, radioactive material injected into the blood to tell where that blood's going. Instead, we're just looking, we're using um, magnetic resonance imaging to um, find the um, uh, the magnetic signal of the hydrogen nuclei in those water molecules in the blood to tell where blood flow is occurring within the body. And then um, using this method, computers distinguish physical structure based upon the different signals they generate. So the MRI is a very useful method, uh, less intrusive than PET scan, obviously less intrusive than uh, lesion studies. And um, lately we have been using this to uh, conduct a functional magnetic resonance imaging, right? In the uh, or early form, when you just had MRI, it took sort of a still image of what the brain looks like. But fMRI is allowing us to um, repeat MRI over time and tell how processes change in the body as uh, the mind thinks. Okay, so the reading for today that you were looking at is using some of these neuroscientific tools to try and get at the nature of moral reasoning, <clears throat> right? Um, so, uh, right, and essentially these kinds of neuroscientific uh, methods have isolated two regions of neural architecture that seem crucial to moral reasoning. Um, sorry, I mean three regions <laughs> there, not two. So these are the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So um, ventromedial, that means the, um, uh, the um, upper middle prefrontal cortex, okay, so that's up here. Um, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so that would be regions down here on the bottom on either side, and then the right temporoparietal junction, so that would be a point on the right side of the brain where the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe 
um, meet up. So, so the um, temporal lobe is the, the, if you've seen, you know, if you think about a picture of a brain, there's a lobe that sort of comes down off the side, that's the temporal lobe. And then the parietal lobe is sort of the middle lobe in the middle of the um, cerebellum. So that at that point where those join together in, on the right side of the brain, that is another area that's been indicated as important to moral reasoning. And right, so here again are those regions. Um, so, oh, sorry, I guess um, uh, ventromedial uh, means uh, uh, underneath in the middle and dorsolateral means upper on either side. Okay. Um, so these regions again um, have been, and there you can see the, uh, the right temporal uh, parietal junction. So these areas have been indicated in emotional moral reason, in moral reasoning, but they've been associated with different kinds of areas. So um, there have been a variety of different studies that have been used to get at these tools. So um, some of these involve trolley car problems. So you might have heard of these before. Uh, I'm relying here upon a study by the authors that you read today but um, a different study than the one that you looked at today, Paxton and Green and some other work of theirs. So um, according to the trolley car problem, you're asked to imagine yourself standing beside uh, a train track when you see an out of control trolley heading towards five people who are bound on a certain track. And you're asked if you would throw a switch, uh, should you throw the switch to divert the train to a side track? If you do this, the train will kill one other person um, and, but it will save the five. And so people are asked if they would uh, throw the switch to save the five and sacrifice the one. Um, you know, there are some moral principles that would suggest you shouldn't do this. Some moral principles say cause no harm. That's a, the, the primary thing you should avoid. Um, but by and large, people say, yes, I, I would throw the switch in this case and allow the trolley to run over the uh, one person to save the five. Um, another kind of case you're asked to imagine is that you're standing over a footbridge. So uh, these trolley problem cases, there's a variety of them, and we put different of them forward to see what other areas come online in moral reasoning. So in this other case, you're asked to stand over a footbridge, uh, or you're, it's suggested that you're standing over a footbridge um, when you see um, a uh, when you see an out of control trolley heading for five people who are on the track, tied up on the track, right? Um, I think of the original study, it's supposed to be workers on the track who can't escape, but it's, it's tied up here for emphasis. Now, in this case, you don't have a switch you can throw to stop the trolley, but standing beside you on the bridge is an extremely large man. And you can shove this large man who's, who's sort of leaning over the edge, we might imagine, over the edge of the bridge in front of the trolley, and, you know, if he falls on the trolley, he'll get all gummed up and the trolley works and stop the trolley from moving so that the um, five people here on the track will be spared. Now, people ask to, uh, if they would like to push this person over the bridge um, to save the five, uh, tend to say no. Most people say, no, I wouldn't do that. Okay. So what's going on here? It looks like the kind of moral calculus reasoning is the same here, um, but for some reason, we're not willing to push the guy, whereas we are willing to throw the switch. And it's been suggested that what's going on here is a kind of emotional component to moral reasoning. So if we look at these two cases from the point of view of principles, we're sacrificing one to save five. So they're, uh, they're computationally equivalent from the point of view of a moral principle that says, uh, you know, prevent as much harm as possible, do the most good as possible. They have the same kind of outcomes in that case. But what's different here is that when you're imagining pushing a guy over the edge of a railing, you implement certain emotional moral reasoning, which is a kind of entirely different system localized to a different brain re region, the VMPC, um, that, uh, that governs this kind of emotional reasoning. So it actually looks like there are a variety of different systems within the brain that contribute to moral reasoning. Uh, in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, we have emotional moral reasoning, um, and we can see that uh, area is active when we consider the case of pushing the large man over the edge. But in the first case, we're thinking only in terms of moral principles and not we don't have the emotional upshot there. Um, the, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is most active. So it seems as though emotional moral reasoning uh, resides in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex where moral principles, whereas moral principles 
uh, that kind of reasoning rely, resides in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And indeed, other areas of the brain, which uh, are involved in other kinds of moral reasoning, have been identified as well. <laughs> okay, so um, the, uh, the additional point here is, right, so we have the VMPC, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and then this other um, kind of idea is that there's a kind of social component to moral reasoning as well. Um, and, and so it's really been thought that the uh, right temporal parietal junction, this area over here, is really implicated in thinking about an agent's moral state. So, right, um, not only can I be affected by the emotions of the situation, not only can I consider the abstract moral principles and think about that, but we also think about like the guilt or innocence of moral agents. And it seems like the right temporal parial junction is where that kind of moral reasoning is found. So again, there that is. Um, so patients with high uh, right temporal parietal junction activation, uh, it has been found made more lenient judgments of accidental harms, right? So um, really, if you're considering whether the agent did it on purpose, right, and that may be a mitigating factor in some case, like imagine someone who accidentally kills someone versus intentionally killing someone. Well, um, agents who have, or, or uh, participants who have higher activation in this right temporal parietal junction area um, end up making more lenient judgments of accidental harms in those cases. So it really seems like that is an area that's involved in, in weighing guilt and innocence of agents. Um, and, and indeed, there's this other method I haven't talked about called transmagnetic um, stimulation. I think that's uh, uh, what it is. I'll look up what that stands for specifically. But essentially, the idea is we've been able to use this, these large magnets to deaden particular portions of the brain. So you just put this against the brain. It shoots out a large magnetic charge. It sort of deadens an area of the brain for a few minutes. And then... Um, you can perform tests on people while that area is sort of numb and not responding appropriately. And um, you can see that uh, in that area, um, if we do deaden the right temporal parietal junction, then people are unable to consider the kind of accidental component of someone performing a bad deed. So in that case, like once you've deadened that area through TMS, um, respondents who previously might have said, well, this guy didn't mean to do that, so he shouldn't uh, get as harsh a penalty, will uh, consider the person who intentionally and the person who unintentionally killed someone as being equally culpable because both of them had, uh, both of their actions resulted in the same consequence. Okay, so turning now to today's read, reading, that's a little primer on how neuroscience has given us some tools for thinking about moral reasoning. So what's today's reading about? Well, in the reading for today, uh, the authors, Green and Paxton in this paper, have a specific question that they're very clear about. The question is, um, well, think about it. People are sometimes presented um, with opportunities for uh, dishonest gain, right? Like maybe you could cheat on an exam and make a better score, or maybe you could lie about the amount of work you've done and get more money for that. Um, so the question is, what makes people, right? I mean, sometimes too, when people are presented with these opportunities for, for dishonest gain, they do the right thing and they don't cheat in that way. So the question is, what makes people be, behave honestly when they're confronted with opportunities for dishonest gain? And Green and Paxton in this reading consider two models. One model they call the will model and one model they call the grace model. So again, the question is, when I have the opportunity to do something dishonest, to earn a gain, for my, to gain something for myself, if I don't do that thing, what makes it the case that I do that? What makes the difference between me, right, who doesn't do the dishonest thing to get some gain, and the other person who does do the dishonest thing in order to have a gain? Okay, um, and so these two models are offered for this account, for this, okay? So one, the will model says that in fact, um, what it's really about is the person who foregoes the, the, um, the benefit that he could acquire through dishonest, uh, through, uh, dishonest activity or through uh, immoral activity, um, the will model says that person, just like the person who goes in for doing the bad thing to get the, the good result, is just as tempted by the um, reward that they could get, right? They're just as tempted as the person who acts dishonestly to get the, uh, to get the um, gain. But the will model says the person who's the good person who rejects that has a strong will. And though they have that temptation, they reject it. They reject that temptation. Right? 
do the right thing in this case. The grace model, on the other hand, says, no, it's not the person has a strong will. It's not really something about uh, their exerting of some extra force that the other person doesn't have. Instead, what it is, is just by the grace of God, the person who does the right thing doesn't feel as much temptation for the uh, bad, the, the bad result, I mean, the, the, um, the, the good result they could gain by dishonest means. Okay, so um, Green and Paxton want to disambiguate these two views. They want to argue whether the grace model or the will model is correct. And so what is their study? Well, here's the setup of their studies. So they use two dependent measures, two things they're looking at in their position, participants. One is reaction time, and one is uh, brain activation that they're indicating through fMRI methods. So what is reaction time? Well, reaction time is just how long it takes someone to do something, okay? Um, and of course, then we're looking also at which areas of the moral brain are active when people are thinking through these cases. So here's Green and Paxton's study. So they tell participants that what they're interested in is participants' ability to predict the future, right? So they want to know about participants' ability to predict the outcome of a virtual coin toss. And right now, it's not just that they want to see how well people can predict the outcome, which should be a chance, right? But they actually want to see if people can um, predict the future um, or if they're better at predicting the future when their predictions are private, they're kept to themselves until after they have to report, and are also financially incentivized. So they have this weird, wacky theory they pretend that they think when people can privately predict what's gonna happen in the future and they can be financially incentivized to predict that thing, that somehow will make the difference and allow them to have this ESP, this extrasensory perception that allows them to predict the coin toss. Now, again, this is just a cover story. This isn't really what they're interested in, but what they really want, they're setting this up to, to give people an opportunity to cheat to see what happened in their brain when they do cheat. So in the study itself, um, participants were um, asked to predict the, um, the outcome of a coin toss, and they are given us an award, an award of $3 uh, for a correct prediction. So they have a financial incentive to cheat. So in some trials, they look at individual participants here. In some trials, those participants record their predictions before the flip, so they had no opportunity to cheat. But in others, those predi though predictions were supposedly made in advance, so the participant is asked to make a prediction, those predictions are actually recorded or written down after the flip has occurred. So these participants did have an opportunity to cheat, okay? And again, the reason for that second condition, according to the participants in the study, is they're being given the opportunity for a private prediction in this case. Um, but of course, it also gives them the opportunity to cheat to record their answers incorrectly afterwards. So here's the experimental sequence and that no op stands for no opportunity to cheat, op stands for opportunity to cheat, okay? So first participants are um, asked to make their prediction for $3. Remember, they're asked to make their prediction, told if they get it correct, they will get $3, okay? Um, and then um, the participants in the no opportunity to cheat are then asked to immediately record their prediction to say whether the flip will be heads or tails, whereas the people in the opportunity to cheat condition are just told randomly select heads or tails. This isn't your prediction. Just click on one of these. Okay. We want to keep things the same, the same between the two conditions as much as possible. The uh, virtual coin flip then occurs. Let's suppose it comes out heads. Then the participants in both conditions record whether or not their prediction was correct. And then they win $3 if they got the prediction correct. Now, again, in no opportunity, they had to make the prediction beforehand, so they didn't get an opportunity to cheat. But in opportunity to cheat, they were actually, uh, you know, uh, in oppor you know, this is called opportunity to cheat for the experimenters, not the participants. They made the prediction privately to themselves and then they report later on when they click on, was, were they correct, okay? So, um, scooping ahead here, um, right? So everyone's responds yes, no to correct, but for no opportunity to cheat, this constitutes an acknowledgement, whereas for ah, this constitutes a report. And so that's the end of a sequence. And again, there are many of these sequences that each participant runs, runs through. In some cases, they'll be in a no opportunity conditions, in others, an opportunity condition. And now, 
Green and Paxton's study had one key assumption. That, that assumption is that people are not in fact psychic. So whether they have the opportunity to um, predict beforehand or not, they should just perform at chance, in fact, right? Like their actual predictions should be at chance for a coin toss, which is a coin toss, which is like 50% of the time they'll get it right, right? And so based on this assumption, we can now look at participants and identify whether they are honest or dishonest given their uh, performance in the opportunity trials. The dishonest participants' performance in guessing correctly will go way up when it comes to the opportunity to cheat trials, but will be at chance in the no opportunity trials, whereas the honest participants will uh, remain at chance throughout. Okay, so we now have a pool of honest people, those who perform close to chance, and a pool of dishonest people, those who perform much better than chance during the opportunity trials. And so we wanna look at what the dishonest people did in the opportunity versus no opportunity. And likewise, for the honest people, and we're gonna look at two things here. We're gonna look at what areas of their brain were active and how long it took them to make their response. The timing component here is based on the following idea. So imagine that the grace model is correct. Uh, or sorry, imagine that the will model is correct. Then the people who do not cheat when they have an opportunity to apparently feel the temptation but suppress it, right? And then, um, and then um, overcome that and choose that they, uh, and report honestly what their result was. Um, so in those, no, in those opportunity to cheat cases, activation for honest people should be higher um, then, uh, I mean, it should take longer for them to perform the uh, reporting activity in the case they have the opportunity to cheat because they could just lie and get a benefit, but they're suppressing that urge and suppressing the urge, feeling the urge is gonna take more time. Whereas we look at, if we look at them in the no opportunity case, they just respond, you know, yes, no, they don't, it's not gonna give them the money in any case because they've already made the prediction before, okay? So it should take the honest people longer in the cases where they have an opportunity to cheat. All right, so again, this is at that same point. I'm just gonna go over it again because it can be a little clearer, I think. So according, Will's prediction here is that honest people have to resist the urge to cheat when they have the opportunity to cheat. So honest should have to do more when they report a loss and have the opportunity to cheat than they were when then when they report a loss and lack that opportunity. So there's a timing prediction. It should take honest longer to respond uh, no to correct in loss opportunity than in loss no opportunity. There's also an activity predict an activation prediction. There should be more activation in regions associated with response conflict, cognitive control, and or response inhibition, inhibition in uh, instances in which they uh, reported a loss and have the opportunity to cheat, right? So the honest people should have more activation in these regions associated with cognitive control because they have to suppress that urge to cheat. Um, and in fact, uh, what we find is um, that brain regions exhibiting increased activity in the opportunity condition is comp comp uh, compared with the no opportunity condition broken down by group. So honest versus dishonest and uh, an outcome type win versus loss. Um, so fMRI data are projected onto a reference anatomical image. Increase, there's increased activity in bilateral, dorsolateral, prefrontal cortex. That's associated with deci the decision to lie, right? Um, in dishonest subjects, right? So when they decide to lie, there's more activation. And indeed, there's increased activity in bilateral uh, areas, in these various areas. Um, when they decide to return, refrain from lying. So in some cases, the people who are uh, dishonest, they don't appear like they're cheating all the time, so they um, make it appear that they're not. Okay, so by Grace's prediction, on the other hand, some will lack the temptation to cheat. So the people who are honest when they have the opportunity to cheat, according to Grace, just don't feel a temptation to cheat even when they have an opportunity. So Grace presents, that there will be no difference in reaction times or activation patterns for honest between the cases when they report a loss and have the opportunity to cheat and the cases in which they report a loss and had no opportunity to cheat. 
it. Um, additionally, since the grace theory says that the dishonest people are cursed with temptation, um, uh, right? They'll that will get this pattern, but they will nonetheless occasionally resist the urge to cheat, right? So maybe they don't want to be found out. So like, even though they could cheat every time, in some cases they'll throw it, right? Because they don't want to appear that they're cheating all the time. Maybe this because they want to, you know, preserve some idea of themselves as good people. So Green and Paxton call this limited honesty. And what they say is that Grace predicts that dishonest have to do more when they report a loss and have the opportunity to cheat than they, when they report a loss and lack the opportunity to report a win. So there's a timing prediction here too. It should take dishonest longer to respond no to correct and loss stop than in the case in which they lost and had no opportunity or in instances where they respond yes in a case where they had uh, the opportunity uh, and lost. Okay, uh, so let me go over that again. Um, so it should take the dishonest the dishonest longer to respond no, right? So they're asked correct after they privately made the prediction. The idea is they're using limited honesty there, right? They don't want to appear like they're bad people. So in that case, they should actually look like honest. You should, it should take them longer time because they are actually having to suppress the desire to cheat in that limited case, okay? And indeed, um, Grace's predictions will say there will be more activation in regions associated with response conflict, cognitive control, and or response inhibition for dishonest in the cases in which they had an opportunity to lose. And now the results were that Grace's, predict Grace's predictions were borne out. There were no differences in reaction time or activation pattern for the honest people between cases in which they had the opportunity and reported a loss in cases in which they had no opportunity to report a loss. However, the dishonest took significantly on, uh, longer in reporting the losses they reported in cases in which um, they had an opportunity to cheat and reported a loss than honesty, right? So in the cases when they're exercising limited honesty, it takes them longer, right? And they had unusual activation reach the PFC associated with control, right? So the people who are honest takes them no longer. They don't have any weird brain activation. The dishonest um, people, right? It actually does take them longer in the limited instances in which they are honest, um, right? And so what this suggests is that the honest people are just not feeling the temptation, but the dishonest people are feeling the temptation. Sometimes they succumb to it. Most of the time they succumb to it, but sometimes they reject it. And in those cases, they do actually have to exercise will, but it is very limited. Okay, so what do you think of this? Does Grace win? Does Will stay in the picture somehow, if so? And do honest deserve credit for no cheating if these findings are correct? And do dishonest deserve blame for cheating? So read over this article, look a little closer at the results, which I think are pretty compelling. And we will talk about this later in the week. That is it. Here are some other questions. More general questions. The end. I'll see you on Thursday and Friday. Goodbye.